Hello, Keith Kaiser here with another study in God's Word. We're doing studies in the book of Acts, and today we're in Acts chapter 8 and verse 3, Acts 8, 3. It says, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Now we've noted these are the events in the immediate aftermath of the murder of Stephen, the church's first martyr in the book of Acts. And even as Stephen was stoned for nothing else than preaching Christ and being faithful to the word of God, so that unleashed open season on the Christians. There was massive persecution that broke out, and the ringleader of it was this Saul of Tarsus, soon to be known as Paul. And verse 3 speaks about him. It says, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church. Uh, now, that kind of strikes fear in the bones. It gives you a shiver down your spine as you think about the destruction that this man was unleashing on the church. Later, he would call himself the chief of sinners because uh, he would say that he uh, was one who persecuted the church. So he never forgot how insidious and how wicked his past life before he came to Christ was. And for that, he was very greatly uh, appreciative of the grace of God which forgave even him, that he uh, could be shown to be the pattern of all long suffering, because God would wait so long and put up with so much evil from Saul, even blaspheming and making others blaspheme the name of Christ and persecuting his church. So he made havoc of the church, and this persecution was uh, egalitarian and comprehensive because it says entering every house. So there was nobody that was necessarily safe, rich or poor, anybody in between there. He could come into your house if there was a gathering of believers. And it says dragging off men and women. So he believed in the equality of the sexes. He didn't care. He was an equal opportunity persecutor. Whether you were a man or a woman, that didn't shield you from the persecution that Saul was carrying out because he was one of the worst uh, of all tyrants. He was that religiously inspired person, that person who is dogmatic in a false spiritual belief. Now, when someone believes a false gospel and they adhere to that so strongly that they're willing to physically persecute others, that's a dangerous scenario indeed. And so when skeptics tell us, oh, you know, religion is the cause of many wars, we agree with that. Historically, that's been shown to be the case. When people talk about how many people have been harmed in the name of God, and many people have done harm in the name of the Lord, we agree with that. That's a matter of history, and even Acts here tells the tale. The difference is when someone truly believes the real gospel, when they come to a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, he takes people that formerly were at enmity with God, and he makes them at peace with himself. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Lord turns the hearts of wicked people, of violent people, of dangerous people, and he pacifies them. Like the man in the Gadarene tombs who was possessed with many demons, a legion of demons. And when they came and saw this man after he had been delivered through the saving power of the Lord Jesus Christ, they noted that he was clothed and sitting at the feet of the Lord Jesus in his right mind. This man who had been fierce, who had been violent and unrestrained, whom they had tried to chain up, and yet he broke his chains and fetters, was now sitting pacified at the feet of the Lord Jesus. A man who, as the hymn writer says, caused me to render up my sword and I shall conquer or be. Well, he had laid down his arms and was no longer fighting against Christ. He was now at peace with God through his relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope everybody listening and watching this will have that similar standing, that you can say you have peace with God, that you're not afraid for the Lord Jesus to come back. You're not afraid to go into eternity and face God because already 
your peace has been made. He is our peace, Ephesians 2 says, who has made both one and broken down the middle wall of partition which was between us. So he unites Jew and Gentile. He unites all sorts of people, whatever race, color, whatever background, whatever socioeconomic distinctions men make. The Lord Jesus is that comprehensive universal Savior who is willing and able to save absolutely anyone who comes to him. Well, conversely here, Saul at this moment in time was an enemy of the Lord Jesus and was seeking to eradicate that name and persecuting the church. And so he'd haul off the men and women and commit them to prison. And later in his testimony, he would say that when they were executed, when they were put to death, he gave his vote. So he agreed, just like he agreed when Stephen was killed. Acts 8.1 told us Saul was consenting unto his death. He said, yes, this is what should happen. Kill them all. Let the God of Israel sort them out. Little knowing that he was killing God's people. Little knowing that he was killing the children of God who knew God and were part of God's family through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, conversely, at that uh, dim time, you know, in opposite to what we read in verse 3, we come to verse 4 and there's a totally different scene. Therefore, those who were scattered everywhere, we might expect it to say, you know, were quiet for a while or kind of hid out or decided to pull back and retrench and reevaluate their position. But it says, therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. So the persecution didn't dim their ardor. It didn't uh, tamp down their enthusiasm or their love for Christ. They continued to preach the word because they have to. They're commanded. We are commanded. In 2 Timothy 4, 2, for example, preach the word, it says. Be instant in season and out of season. And the Lord Jesus had said before he ascended back to heaven, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature in Mark 16. And so that's what they were doing. They were obeying the Lord and their enthusiasm was such that they had to teach it. Just like the apostles before said that they had to obey God rather than man. They couldn't stop preaching in this name. So these nameless followers of the Lord Jesus, anonymous disciples, we might call them, continued to preach the word. But then specifically, there's one individual, someone we've already met in Acts chapter 6. Here's Philip. And Philip is the man who's mentioned with that group of men that were of good report, along with Stephen and the others, who were to take care of the matter of the distribution to the widows. And Stephen is listed first and Philip second. And uh, often he's referred to as Philip the evangelist because Philip is used here in a tremendous way as an evangelist in Samaria and at the end of the chapter used to reach a lost soul, the Ethiopian eunuch. This is not the Philip who was one of the twelve, Philip of Bethsaida, Philip from Galilee, but this is apparently another Philip. And he went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. So again, uh, the message they were preaching wasn't be good. It wasn't clean up your act. It wasn't be nice to others or, or hope for a better world. The message they were preaching was Christ. Later, Paul would affirm this as well. In Corinthians, he would say, we preach Christ and him crucified. In 1 Corinthians 2, he says, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So that was the core thrust of the message. The Lord Jesus, who is Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, the one who came and died for our sins, according to the scriptures, who was buried and on the third day rose again from the dead, according to the scriptures. And so he preached Christ to them. Now, the result was astonishing. He preached Christ to them, and it says in verse 6, And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. So there's that phrase again, so common in the early part of Acts, with one accord. We read about the apostles being one in one accord earlier in the book. We read about the believers who were saved on the day of Pentecost being of one accord. And now we read about the Samaritans with one accord listening to this message. And what attracted them to it was the signs and wonders that were being done. Again, this was a new dispensation. This was the beginning of the church age. Something new was transpiring. It was now the age of the Spirit. Messiah had come. He had died. He had risen again from the dead. 
and he had ascended up on high, leading captivity captive. He was now seated on the right hand of God, the right hand of the majesty on high, as Hebrews puts it. And so he had poured out the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had begun something that didn't exist before, the one body composed of Jew and Gentile, and the Samaritans were having the opportunity to be part of it. And so this was authenticated with miracles, with works of power. And specifically, verse 7 hones in on one type of miraculous activity. It, it talks about exorcism, about casting out unclean spirits. Verse 7, For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. So there were physical results that as people heard this message and believed on the Lord Jesus, they were delivered uh, from demonic possession, delivered from physical maladies as well. And that led to conversion, and it led to what verse 8 says, there was great joy in that city. Now, that's ever and always a result of the preaching of the gospel. It produces joy for those who believe it. If someone receives the Lord Jesus Christ, they're receiving one who leads us to the Father. And the psalmist said, in thy presence is fullness of joy. You know, you can't have real and lasting joy, joy that is eternal in duration and character apart from knowing God. And you can only know God through the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, no man knows the Father except the Son and he to whomsoever the Son reveals him. So when one believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, they have joy. They have the joy of sins forgiven. They can say, my sins and iniquities he will remember no more. That's part of the new covenant. Because the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Because that sacrifice that Jesus offered on the cross has put away sin fully and finally. Because the Lord Jesus has been raised up and made both Lord and Christ, we are triumphant over sin and death and hell. We're not going to be separated from God. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, Romans 8 says. And so the gospel produces joy in those who believe it. And the evidence of the truth of the gospel is seen in changed lives, life after life that's been radically altered. Well, my life is such an evidence of that. And if you're a believer, your life is also an, an evidence of that. We are testimonies to the grace of God. We don't preach, hey, we're better than other people, or hey, we're more deserving of salvation than other people, or hey, we got here by our bootstraps, pulling ourselves up, so to speak. No, we say, I'm the sinner for whom Christ died. I was that bad that only the blood of the Lord Jesus, only his life's blood poured out in sacrifice for me, only him dying as my substitute, bearing my sins in his own body on the tree, only that was sufficient to save me. <clears throat> and it's a wonderful message that truly is good news. When people realize that their sins aren't going to be brought up by God before them legally, that they're not going to be separated from God for eternity, that they now have meaning and purpose in life, that they now enjoy the peace which passes understanding because they have peace with God that they're going to be with the Lord forever and forever, and no one can pluck them out of the Lord's hand, that produces joy in their life, as well as the daily joy of enjoying the Lord, of spending time with him. And you say, how can we do that? If Jesus is physically in heaven today, exalted as Lord in Christ, how can we know this one personally and intimately day by day? Well, it's a marvelous thing that John 1.1 1, 1 famously calls the Lord Jesus the Word. And he's the living Word in that sense, the Word that was incarnated. In other words, he walked around on two feet showing us what the scriptures were talking about all the time, showing us the Father, showing us what God is like. He's the image of the invisible God. He said, he that had seen me had seen the Father. And the Lord Jesus, therefore, was the living Word. But there's an intimate connection between the living word and the written word. The written word is God-breathed. It's inspired by the Spirit of God. And so as we read it, the Spirit takes that word and he shows Christ to us. And as we pray to the Lord, we can talk to the Lord about what's on our heart. We can bring the Lord our needs, of course. That's supplication. 
We can thank the Lord for what he's done. That's thanksgiving. We can pray for other people. That's intercession. We can worship the Lord. That's being taken up with who he is. And we can praise the Lord. That's giving him glory and honor for what he has done. And all of these things we prayerfully do as we read the word and learn about him, our hearts respond in talking to him and pouring out ourselves to him. And whether we're joyful in the moment, uh, whether we're happy, I should say, in the moment, because joy is something that we can have amidst tears. Joy can happen while we're in sorrow. Joy can happen as we mourn because we look beyond the pain. We look beyond what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4 for our light affliction, which is but for a moment. The afflictions we suffer in this world, <coughs> they are transitory. They're not permanent. They are momentary. They don't last forever. What is eternal is the life we have with Christ. And our life is hid with Christ in God. And when he who is our life appears, then shall we appear also with him in glory. Well, this is a wonderful salvation and truly good news for anyone who receives it. I hope you know that message for yourself today. And if you don't, today's the day you can believe on the Lord Jesus and be saved. Thank you for listening.